Hello, everyone. Bob Koshignano with another episode of Hazmat 101 Consultant Spotlight. Today, we're spotlighting Fire Chief Manny Navarro. Chief Navarro has been the fire service for over 40 years, first starting his career off in the Fairview Fire District, later moving up to the ranks of the Oakland Fire Department, and finally becoming the Fire Chief for Colorado Springs. Chief Navarro has also served as part of California's Task Force 3 and 4. He served on many boards and has written many publications. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the bridge collapse that happened in Oakland and the lessons learned from that tragic incident. We're also going to talk a little bit about the fire service in the past and where it's going in the future. So please sit back and enjoy, and we want to thank Chief Navarro for his time. Take care. Chief Navarro, how are you, sir? I'm great, Bob. Thank you for asking. Oh, thanks for being here. This is, uh, like I said, I I've, didn't have the pleasure of working with you, but I know many people who have, and, and uh, we chatted on the phone, and, and I was like, you know, this is something I could stay on the phone for hours just listening to you and, <laughs> and the things you come up with and, and talked about. But but again, Chief, thanks for, for agreeing to do this with me. Um, one of the things that... You know, I've been retired now five years, which I can't believe. Um, my dad's been coming up retired, I think, 27 years. He's been retired. So um, one of the things that we're trying to do is that kitchen talk, that table talk, to, to pass down some of the information and the little nuggets, even if it's telling a story. You know, I my dad came to our station one day and talked about a fire where we lost an assistant chief back in the 70s. And, you know, to, to hear him tell the story, even though I've, I've heard it multiple times in front of the what we call kids nowadays and watch them listen, they still were picking up little nuggets of things that he talked about. And I think it's really important for us to keep that that thing going. You yeah. know, we got to listen to the people invite invite the retired people back to the station um, and talk about the pictures on the wall. I know one of the stations I worked at, there was pictures all over the place that, you know, the, the history goes back decades and decades and decades. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but again, thanks for, uh, for doing this. Um, you had an interesting to say the least call. Um, and I'm going to switch right over to the pictures and then I'll let you just, just run with it from there. And this was the Cypress Bridge collapse? Yes, it, it was actually, they call it the Cypress Viaduct. It was built in the 50s. It was one of the uh, early uh, overhead in West Oakland is an historic area. And, and so in order to get to the Bay Bridge, they basically took a roadway and put it above the, the roadways. So all the streets were intersected on, on below. So they built this, this interchange. Uh, there's two decks, uh, one deck going south, one deck going north towards San Francisco. And then in 1989, the Loma Prieta, which, which is a fairly significant earthquake. Interesting enough, it was 75 miles south of this viaduct, but the seismic wave corresponded with the way they aligned these, these columns. And it destroyed that that uh, roadway, about a mile and a quarter of roadway. Wow. Now you were, if I remember right, when we were talking, you and another gentleman basically split the incident command up at that point, right? Tell us a little bit about that. It, the interesting thing is I, I taught uh, urban search and rescue early on when we first started in California. I was kind of like the in-house guy that, that could do some assistance. I was a day off. I came into my battalion headquarters because my house was okay. And they immediately called me downtown and they immediately sent me out to uh, the overhead. I, and this is part of the interesting thing. We had an old assistant chief and um, we called him Mad Dog because he would just yell and scream at you on a regular <laughs> basis. I got a guy as a driver and we drove downtown. I pull up and back and he comes out and screams at me to go down to the freeway because the freeway collapsed. And I told him, I said, I said, John, I said, you're going to have a lot of buildings down on the ground. The freeway's not going to come down. The unreinforced concrete from my training 
uh, <laughs> this is what's going to happen. And I guess I was in my, you know, mid forties at the time. I was young and full of, so we, he screams at me, get your ass down there. So I drove and told my driver, when I get to be the big guy, I won't make dumb mistakes like this. And then we get there and like, holy mackerel, the freeway's down. <laughs> well, there was a PC that was there originally. And we split it right in the middle. Grand Avenue on one side of it, and I take everything on the north side. I really did not know at that time the full extent of the collapse. I got out of the vehicle with my radio, and I told my driver, go down and tell me how far it goes. And it went all the way down to where it went to surface again to go to the bridge. So we had, you know, a mile and a quarter of freeway that was full of cars. Wow. Now, how long was it before? Let me switch one of the other pictures. How long was it before that you guys were able to, you know, I can see you're, you guys right there trying to do some type of search, it looks like, or, or, you know, hear if anybody's calling out. Were there were there any survivors from that? This, this is an early photo. The one you saw before that, which shows the before and kind of after with, you can see Shrine underneath the freeway. This is early on uh, on that scenario. And one of the things that I would like listeners to understand is that when, when you have an extensive collapse like this, one of the things we taught in USAR is that there's going to be all kinds of spontaneous rescues. And what you'll see in this picture is your CCHP Heaven help you. There's a cop climbing up a ladder. There's ladders that that from truck one that in the in the background, and they're assisting civilians and EMS people and and construction people. Everybody was just jumping on and trying to do the best they could. There were right. quite a few survivors at the top because it just collapsed on down. Even though we did have some non survivors, and we have some people who even got out from in between. Um, we lost 45 people together, but this is the first spontaneous effort of everybody to get everybody off that thing. And what we used to teach in the USAR is that when you get there, this thing is huge. A building that's collapsed or, or a structure that's collapsed, one of the things you can anticipate is there's going to be some spontaneous stuff. And what we used to tell our rescuers is you yell and say, please, everybody come this way. And those people that walk to you, you've rescued you know, they're they're basically survivors. They may be injured. You can set up some 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 medical uh, provisions for it, but it's after that you really start looking. You know, wh what do you need to do in terms of heavy equipment, and how do you get into a situation like this? Uh, this is this is probably the best picture out of, out of the group because it shows everybody. Uh, I think we had an estimate of about 130 plus people that went to the hospital that we never even touched. Wow. You know, they got on cabs, they got on personal vehicles, whatever. They just got off of there and went to the hospital. Now, were there any fires or other hazards, fuels, whatever that you guys were having to contend with at the same time as the collapse? Yes. If you see in the distance, you see a little bit of smoke. We actually had a fairly significant fire um, in the first the first layer. There was a truck that was in there and it crushed all the diesel and that thing took off and we end up with a ladder pipe trying to put that thing out but throughout this structure there was fuel all over the place so we had at least two good fires oh geez now did oakland have did they have a hazmat team at the time or did you guys just from your training we, we did i you know the it, truth be told i i had a hazmat background because i worked in livermore you know you know a nuclear facility for crying out loud and when i was a young lieutenant they wanted me to stand up in a hazmat team um so i basically put up together a re request of what we would need and the chief said oh no 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 we don't we don't want that we just <laughs> so they they put it together they did put an individual together uh in kidney corporandi his brother actually was retired from san francisco uh but Tom did actually a pretty good job of standing up. We didn't have much at this time. I mean, right. we didn't have level A suits and all those other kinds of things. Yeah, and, and right there, you guys are busy trying to rescue people that still might be, you know, able to be saved. So yeah. lots of things going on at the same time, for sure. Um, yeah. Here's a, just to give some of the, the viewers another perspective on how that shifted and, and collapsed. I mean, that's, every time I see this, it just 
Wow. Yeah, that the rebar that's in these columns is about two and five eighths inches is the largest they had at the time. They didn't basket it and they had a joint basically when they put this. If you can envision um, what you would do in your house, you put up, you put a, a post up and across the top of it, you have a beam. The beam in this is called a bent cap and that bent cap, then they basically framed out what would be the roadway those bent caps gave way because the columns gave way and they came down. And in some cases, if you can just imagine it, the engine uh, of some of these vehicles was crushed down to like an inch or two inches. That's how much weight Jeez. it was. There. There's no survivors under that part. No. Wow. And this was this was just two decks, right? At two decks. That's two it. Decks. Yeah. Okay. Four, four, four lanes going in either direction. So four lanes going north, uh, the bottom section was going towards San Francisco. The top section is coming back. And, uh, and if people remember, this was the World Series that day That's between right. the Giants and Oakland A's. And, and the reality was there were very few people on the freeway. Typically, this would have been hundreds and hundreds of cars. It was not uh, that much traffic that day because everybody was getting home early, myself included, for my day off job, right? To watch the ball game. And um, that ball game probably saved hundreds and hundreds of lives. Wow, you know, and you don't even you don't even think about it like that. That's just incredible. And here's here's another really good shot of, of what the spontaneous can be. The somebody got a forklift. They had a, a container. They rose the container up so they could get in between those decks. And those are all civilians. It's about every one of them. They just all jumped in to try to help out. It, it is amazing uh, to see. We, we've had a couple of scenarios like that where, where I'm at, where everybody's just, just helping out, whether it's help you yeah. move a supply line or, uh, you know, yeah. whatever the case may be, um, holding C-spine on, on somebody when you got a mass mm -hmm. casualty incident or, or whatever. It's, uh, it's nice when you see everybody come together, that's for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the last picture here. Yeah. And this is, <laughs> I, I, even now, and it's been years since that time, I, I am so impressed because you remember, you know, you know, I was at the time, I'm trying to think now, I was probably about 45 years of age. I was a fairly, you know, maybe five years as a, as a district chief. And when I pulled up on this thing, even after all the training I had and the study I'd done, I, I thought, you know, where do we start? I mean, okay. how do we, how do we take this thing apart? Um, and, you know, and literally I had no command vehicle. I just had a, a car and a uh, small piece of paper that I could scribble on a radio, handheld radio. It was crazy. Now, how long was it before you went from rescue to recovery? What was the time frame on that? Well, um, uh, that's another story altogether, Bob, because <laughs> what, what we did is we did as, as much as we could because it was late in the afternoon into early in that evening to probably around one or two o'clock in the morning. They pulled me downtown and they asked that same question. <clears throat> and I told them definitively that we had a pretty good handle on the top of that. We did a, not only a primary search, but we basically had walked it twice and looked at everything we possibly could. I, I could assure them there was no rescues at all on the top. The lower section, we pulled some people out of that, but I had not done a really a primary search for the entire structure. I hadn't even scheduled it out because we didn't have enough time and enough equipment or what have you. So my thought to them was that until I clear that, until that can happen, uh, we got to continue operations. They were wanting to stand it down and give it over to uh, the, the state because it was a state freeway. Mm. And I told them, I said, I, I can't, I can't say yes. I can't say yes to that. So I pushed it and I was able to then map it out. What I did is I called a recon group in. And we took the entire section of that roadway. Even every one of those columns has a three, three digit number that the engineers use. 101, 102, 103, 104. So I had them map between 101, 102, and then the four lanes and write down everything we knew about that. And we were able to clear sections 
because those sections, we already get in there, we could see there was nothing there. Other sections, we couldn't even get to because there was so much debris. So it was un, you know, unknown. We could see maybe a license plate number or something. So basically we then put together, they were gonna, from either end, gonna go down into those areas and see what we could find. They, I, I was fought tooth and nail with, with command really saying, when's it gonna be done, when's it gonna be done? And I said, I can't tell you until I clear this thing. Right. Well, right. We did find somebody. Uh, probably saved my job because it was Tuesday. It was late Friday, early Saturday morning. We found a survivor. And, wow. Uh, wow. So I, it, you can't give up on it because otherwise, you know, that guy was sitting there in that car from Tuesday until Saturday morning. Unfortunately, he had other medical problems, passed away later on in the hospital. But the reality is, I felt confident that we'd cleared that 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 um, on a primary and a secondary search that entire section, and it took a lot of heavy equipment to do it. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, one of the things that yeah, I always things always was concerned with, especially in just simple search of a of a fire, is, and I remember this one where we had a house fire or apartment fire, and they said it was a handicapped person in the apartment and the whole place was just going. And I just had this gut feeling, man, I got to search this again. And we probably searched that room four or five times because I yep. did yep. not. And based on the information we had, and luckily when it was over, you know, there he was outside, but you know, you just, one of those things you just said, no, you need to go look again just to be sure. And, and fortunately yep. for, and yep. for us, it worked out, but. And if, if nothing else, it, it, you may not have a survivor, but you have a victim and you're able to recover yeah. uh, the remain. And the last thing you want, and it happened to a city adjacent to, to Oakland, they had a fairly significant hotel fire. And then they called it and left. And then several days later, the construction people found, found the remains. Mm. You know, it's, it, it's just not okay. That's our job. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. Well, so that and that like i said was was a great call i've i've remember reading it and 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 whatnot over the years and so finally getting the chance to talk to somebody that was actually there uh it was great it's some of the you know the questions we had talked about um looking back at your career what are some of the things that you would you would some some do's and don'ts let's just say that you would give the young firefighter, the young company officer, the young administrator, you know, whomever? You know, it's the best way to do is really like we do, Bob. We tell stories, right? And when I first, when I first made battalion chief, I was really young. I was in my 30s when I made battalion chief, which was hysterical. But I had six years of fairly technical training before I went to Oakland anyway. So five years in Oakland and six years before that. But I, I was given the challenge of equipment for uh, apparatus. And we had these really unusual roofs downtown because the buildings were so old and they would tar and go over the top of these things. And we had some roofs that were, you know, we had inches and inches of tar. And so we would go up there with our axes to try to, you know, open that thing up a little bit before we could get a saw in. And then partner K-12 came out with this wonderful, powerful saw, right? And so as smart as I am, I figured, well, we, we need to buy these things. And I started to do my research. And in my research, I found out that LA City bought 130 of these things, right? Well, they got to be great. If you can buy 130, we're well, not going to buy that many. So I bought a bunch of them and I gave them to my truck guys. And I was a truck officer for a while. And they come on down and I said, hey, how's the saws working out? You really want to know? I said, well, it's Manny. You can talk to me. They <laughs> suck, chief. I said, what do you mean they suck? He said, they're underpowered. They don't work. Da, 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 da. You know, we had the larger blades on it. And I thought, my God, what happened here? So I was in LA. I was meeting with Chief Ramirez, as a matter of fact, waiting on him. as a young guy. And I said, hey, show me your apparatus. Yes, sir. Well, you know, LA, really. You know. So I opened the camera, and there's one of those partner K-12. So I said, hey. How's that saw? And you could see the look on his face, right? Firefighters may not tell you if you're an <laughs> officer, but if you look in their face, 
he can tell something. He says, come on, kid, you can tell me. He says, they suck. Well, <laughs> here's, here's, the, here's the thing about leadership. You're not the smartest guy in the room. If you're going to buy a piece of equipment, tool, or what have you, get it to the crew, give it to them, have them beat the crap out of it. Because because they will tell you if you're open and honest with it, it's, it, you know, it's nothing about your leadership at all. Your leadership is making a good decision. The good decisions come from the bottom up sometimes, especially with that kind of equipment. Yeah. Um, that was that was a learning. And from then on, you know, I, 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 when I first got into Colorado Springs Fire Department, uh, I was there for to look at some housing. They were going to give me an apartment for a while until I got something. I was I was single at the time. And I stopped by one of the fire stations and the captain was there and they knew that I was going to be the new chief that had seen the paper they hadn't met me. I walk in and they've got a climbing wall, right? And because we have we have rocks and mountains here right. and they do some of the rescue stuff. So he shows me his climbing wall and I said, oh, that's great. And I had technical background on on rope or rigging but for buildings not so much for for wilderness and so he got motivated you know this this guy will listen he says can i show you my gear and i said sure and he opens up the compartment and he says Here, here's my gear is his boots and his jacket and stuff and kind of shoddy i mean really he looked <laughs> not too good and and he said i bring these from home and I asked, I says, what do you mean you bring them from home? Said, the department doesn't supply you with gear for climbing. He said, no, sir. And I said, well, give me a chance to get, get my feet on the ground, right? So I get, I get to work, and I'm there maybe a month, and my deputy that was there walks in, and he wants to show me his furniture that he bought for his office. Shh. And I walk into his office and he's got these wonderful plush chairs and stuff. And I walk back to my office. I picked up the phone. I called the captain. I said, get down to North Face, buy yourself and the crew, everything you need, send me the bill. Wow. Now, now, that was just the right thing to do. But in terms of leadership for that organization, everybody in that department knew the deputy bought fancy stuff. And they didn't have their stuff, and the chief turned right around and gave him that stuff. So I mean, uh, I, I never forget it because basically, uh, he was he was able to retire pretty quickly. I think I think I put a little pressure on him, and, and the, the chair and the chairs disappeared for crying out loud. But who cares? You know? <laughs> well, I tell you what that that is a that is the definition of leadership right there. There's, um, you know, I've I was fortunate in my career that for the majority of it was, was in special ops, whether it was back when I was on a, a truck company uh, in the city I worked for, uh, before we had a heavy rescue, it was a heavy rescue. So we did dive high angle and hazmat. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we did that we were like, holy cow, but we had at the time, the right people pushing the right buttons. And, and to, yep. to our credit, we had a lot of decent stuff and that, that helped out throughout the years. And there's a lot of departments, you know, I travel, as you and I were talking uh, about travel around the country, do different teachings and to see some of the stuff that, you know, like you mentioned, the guys have bring in their own stuff and you yep. just, you're like, man, it's 2024. How is that happening? Yeah. Um, yeah. But priority, everybody's got different priorities, I guess. So, it, you know, that's, that's all you can do. Um, take a little quick turn before we wrap it up in technology. Some of the some of the new the older technology versus the newer technology, um, where 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 we were and where we're going. What what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, you, you got to remember, I I started in nineteen sixty six, so when I left the rig, there was no radio. The only radio we had, we didn't have portables at the time. It was a small district, and then when I went to Lawrence National Laboratory, we had great big five waters that were military style, like a suitcase. I mean that. That's where the technology was at the time. Uh, and we re really were space age because we had the best S SCBAs, what have you. But what we are today, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost unthinkable when you, when you look at it in you know, the, the decades that I've spent on time. I will say this, is that I've seen some things that are still in the hopper. Um, I was have, had an opportunity to look at 
a, an inventor that's looking on buyer metrics. You know, I worked in Menlo Park for about 11 years when I went left to uh, Colorado Springs. And we had a technology conference there for, with drones because we were big in the drones. We went to this this think tank and this individual had a basically a vest. And that vest was able to not only monitor what was going on with that employee, but give that data back to a command center. Now, I don't know where they're at with it now, but I'm sure that's going to happen. The other technology that I looked at that I know is out there, it's it's mounted on your on your helmet. That's an, another question altogether. But really what it does is it throws out a signal and gives you a hard outline of what you're looking at through smoke. Doorways, furniture, bodies, what have you. And every time it throws out a signal, it enhances it. It also takes that same signal, and gives it back to command, so you can see what they're looking at. It monitors where that person is. Uh, it does all those kinds of things. And Bobby, I'm sure you had the same situation I've had, where I've crawled back in there with my hands and knees, and I'm not really sure what I'm feeling because I can't see. I can't see anything, you know. And I mean, the, the one thing that, that bugs me to this day is crawling back there. Mom and dad were pointed at the windows in a residential fire scene. My baby's up there. I went in after that kid and I'm crawling around and I put my hand up in its crib, mm. you know? And so you got to get up and go and, you know, force the little, little guy never survived and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. In the back of my mind, I came thinking if I was able to just look and see and know exactly where that was and get right to him and get right to a window um, and get that kid outside right away. Uh, so we're there. The other one that I think is really going to be very impactful that, that I think the fire service has to get on top of. And here's, here's the, the analogy I use. No matter what I want to do, I want to go fishing and I take a look at my computer and I'm looking at all the fishing stuff and pretty soon they're sending me all the stuff and I can go to Amazon and I say, I'd like to have, you know, I'd like to have this reel. Or I'd like to have this gear. They're going to advertise back to me, but I can buy that thing. And from the minute I buy it, it's tracked all the way to my doorstep, including on my doorstep. Yet you can pick up the call phone, call 911. You have no idea who's coming, when they're coming, when they're going to get there and where they're at. I mean, it's, 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 it's that end of it. And I think at some point, at some point, we're going to have to tell politicians, you better get your fire service some funding so they can get the technology that's available today. And now when you're looking at drones and what they're able to do with that, yeah. um, I know yeah. we, we were looking at drones with uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. We had we had boats that went out. We had some time to get the boat in the water, get it launched, get the gear going, everything else. We could send our drone out and that drone can paint exactly where that that you know, that person is whether they're in a boat or in a car or wherever they have them to be. We had all these mud flats, and people get a their boat in there, and then the tide would go out, and they go, "Crap! <laughs> how do we get out of here?" So we we'll wait for twelve hours, and the tide comes back. We'd have to go get them. Well, that drone can paint it. Boom. So even as you're going there, the command person can start taking a look at it, know where their assets are, know which boats are available, and what have you. The technology is available. We just don't have it. Yeah, we, you know, from the hazmat side of it, you know, we were looking at ways to just record the guys going down range when I remember when GoPro first came out and we were trying to figure out, you know, how we were yeah, going to do yeah. this and so on. And now I've got a bunch of friends around the country that use drones with the FLIR system and have yeah. really seen, you know, uh, phosphorus fires burning under through the piles that you wouldn't even know. And it just, you know, the stories yep. go on yep. and on and on. Um, yep. So yeah, that's, that's great technology. Yeah. I, and like I said, it, it's not, it's not that we don't want it and not that we can't use it. It's, it's dollars and cents. And yeah. when you look at uh, even with, the, with the technology that, cause we experimented with it back in, in, in metal, the, the see through technology, we 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 could not get get it funded the way we wanted to get it funded. That's all there is to it. And here's an interesting aspect of it. Um, 
that same individual that uh, had that technology had gone to the manufacturers of SCBAs. God, especially, they came down and looked at it. And there's no question that in the mass technology, that stuff would have worked. I'm not going to do it. They're, they can't they can't change everything over on their manufacturing for that at risk because the market's not that big. Yeah, They're, we don't we don't buy a lot of stuff. Right. That, but you see what a jet pilot has. I mean, <laughs> yeah, everything's. Right. In the yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So. I, yeah. Well, hopefully some one day somebody will get their head where it needs to be. Um because we've had a lot of things over the years that, that we've tried to push and, and, you know, some things work. And, and I think one of the biggest failures that we've had, um, and, and not just my previous departments for the couple that I worked at, but around the country is we get reliant upon grants. And as we told when I, when I worked for the department retired from, we told them for years, don't rely on grants. Our meter budget alone, just for all our meters for maintenance, was $70,000. Yeah, yeah. And then by the time I left, the entire special ops budget was, let's just say, greatly reduced. Um, and because we got relied upon, you know, we relied too much on grants. And now they're having to start kicking in the money again and, and, and what have you. So. Yeah, we got it. We got to. We well, got to get the funds. Yeah, I've been. I've been on that side of that. You know, obviously, I was a the fire chief in Colorado Springs for fourteen years, and we had so many issues relative to to fund you know, just apparatus alone. So I, I'm fully aware of that. Plus, Colorado Springs is a Northern Command, and so we're a highly military. The Air Force Academy. Sure. Uh, we have people. Uh, some who are on console that that understand that that we're like a small army. If you do not fund that army in terms of training, logistics, supplies, what have you, it, they they cannot function at the level that they need to function at, and that needs to be articulated. I I think there's some hope up there. The the new you know fire administrator that's there, uh, she comes from you know basically IFF is where she came from. She's pushing really hard on lots of different issues. And I, th I think she's got the horsepower and the ambition and the smarts to be able to maybe make some of this happen. Because okay. if you look at the original, the original, uh, you know, America's burning, right. part of that was to fund those kinds of issues, right? Get some money out there for, for some people, uh, not in just in grants, but in f full funded. So yeah, uh, I agree. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, before we take off, uh, let me just go through a couple of things with our audience. And I want to remind everybody of a new publication that's come out. We started about six months ago, a digital publication called Hazmat HQ. Each month, several articles um, from well-renowned people around the country and other places. So check it out. You can go to hazmathq.com, check out the latest issues. And then some websites to take a look at. Hazmat 101 Consultants, our Facebook and YouTube. There's other, other spotlight episodes such as this, as well as our monthly HazChat series. The Hazmat Guys Roundtable on Facebook, the first Tuesday of every month, 8 p.m. Eastern Live. Myself, Bobby Salvinson, Mike Monaco from FDNY Hazmat One, and Jeff Zyantek from Phoenix do a live show. Chime in, ask us questions, make fun of us, whatever you want to do. And then some Hazmat groups. Hazmat Group 2, Hazmat Group, and Common Sense. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. If you have a question, ask. These people on there are great. They want to help out, um, and, and everybody is there to help one another. So I, I encourage you to check out all those spots. Chief, it has been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate it so much, um, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Sure. Thanks you so much, Bob. Say hello to everybody for me. I sure bye, will. Bye-bye.